President. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, here I am again with my uh, trusty battered chart by my side, this time here to talk about the looming costs and economic risks of climate upheaval. Almost exactly five years ago, I sent around a binder about this thick to all of my Senate colleagues, in which I compiled some of the most compelling warnings about the looming climate economic crisis. I have just recently updated it and shared it with all of the Budget Committee members. It's now more like this thick, as the warnings just keep piling up. These warnings come from central bankers, economists, asset managers, insurance companies, investment banks, credit rating agencies, and leading management consultants, folks with a lot of credibility when it comes to economics, finance, corporate risk, and their effect on government spending and revenues folks who often have a fiduciary obligation to get this right. The Budget Committee has started to dig into these warnings. We've just held the first two of a series of hearings on climate impacts to our federal budget. Our second hearing, held earlier today, explored warnings of crashes in coastal property values amid rising seas, and more powerful storms. One of our witnesses was Kate Michaud, the town manager of Warren, Rhode Island. And next time we'll spell Rhode Island correctly. Um, Warren is the smallest town in the smallest county of our smallest state. There, like many small coastal towns all around the country, in Georgia and elsewhere, the problems are real, and they are immediate. She testified that some homes in Warren have seen their value drop by one-third because of flood risk. And sea level rise is projected to permanently flood some coastal portions of Warren over the next decade. This is mapping that is done by the state of Rhode Island that shows the projected flooding zone of Warren and all of these are existing buildings and homes that uh, will be inundated. Warren is not alone. Zillow's real estate database has identified over 4,800 homes in Rhode Island that would be underwater with a projected six feet of sea level rise, which is projected for Rhode Island. That's nearly $3 billion in home values. And Rhode Island is not alone. The U.S. has nearly 13,000 miles of coastline. 40% of our population lives along the coast. More than a trillion dollars worth of residential and commercial real estate is coastal. And for most American households, their greatest wealth is their home. First Street Foundation, whose CEO testified at this morning's hearing, examines flood risk. It's what they do. And their examination shows significantly increasing risks to residential properties over the next 30 years. And Rhode Island does its own flood projections, and they show similar risks. Just two weeks ago, a study found real estate exposed to flood risks was overvalued i.e., the flood risk had not yet been taken into account, by up to a staggering $237 billion, with the worst property overvaluations along coasts. And of course, Florida, with all of its coasts, is the prime liability. The study warns that, as a result, coastal real estate values may plummet and that can cascade into systemic risks for the mortgage market. Freddie Mac, the mortgage giant, has made very similar warnings about coastal property values. 
Their former chief economist, who also testified at this morning's hearing, has said, and I'm quoting him here, the economic losses and social disruption are likely to be greater in total than those experienced in the housing crisis and Great Recession. Anybody who was here through that 2008 housing crisis and the recession that followed knows how sobering that warning is. And it comes from that collapse in coastal property values, triggered by difficulty in getting mortgage and insurance with its 30-year lead time, collapsing values, and then cascading out into the rest of the economy. Sea levels are rising, and the rate is accelerating. That's a scientific fact. As homes and businesses in coastal communities face more frequent sunny day flooding and wetter and more violent ocean storms, more homes will be underwater, both literally and figuratively. Insurance will become more expensive and harder to find. Mortgages depend on insurance, so lending will suffer. Coastal communities will become harder places to live and work, and real estate values and local tax bases will decline. Moody's is already looking at local municipal bonds in this light. In emergencies, coastal communities will turn to the federal government for financial assistance. Federal flood insurance costs will rise. For home mortgages, banks and insurance companies will look ahead 30 years. So long before the ocean laps at physical doorsteps, those markets will be hit. And the effect in real estate markets across the country will bring harsh consequences for families and their financial stability. I used the term systemic risk earlier. Systemic risk is a bland term used by economists. What it refers to is anything but bland. It refers to the massively destabilizing events that can cascade out and trigger general economic recession. Think of the mortgage crisis in 2008. 20% of household wealth was wiped out in two years. Unemployment soared, and government revenues were reduced for a decade. There is broad concern here about deficits. Well, deficits tripled as a result of that 2008 shock. According to CBO, revenues fell by $4.4 trillion, and projected spending rose by $800 billion to fund the recovery for a net debt increase total of over $5 trillion from that event. Well, we should see the writing on the wall when it comes to climate risks. At our first hearing, Dr. Mark Carney, who has been governor, their phrase for CEO, of the Bank of England and of the Bank of Canada, gave us the scale of the risk. He testified that, and I'm quoting him here, over the balance of this century, climate change could reduce the level of global GDP per capita by 10 to 20 percent without efforts to limit warming. That would be the equivalent of a decade of no economic growth." End quote. Bob Litterman, an economist who spent more than two decades managing risk for Goldman Sachs as its chief risk officer, now chair of the Climate-Related Market Risk Subcommittee at the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, testified, and I'm quoting here, we are on track for somewhere between 2.2 and 3.4 degrees of warming by 2100, which would result in GDP losses of somewhere between 2.6 and 4 percent. That is more than our recent annual growth rate, implying the possibility of long-term negative growth as climate change worsens." End quote. This is not a future problem. Some of these warned-of risks are already upon us. Already climate-related natural disasters increase federal spending on disaster assistance, flood insurance, crop insurance, and other programs. Already, extreme heat and drought force Western farmers to leave land unplanted and reduce livestock herds. Droughts around the world already 
hit cotton production, right? raising costs on products like medical gauze and cloth diapers. Insurance prices are already through the roof. In Florida and Louisiana, hammered by increasingly violent hurricanes, and out west, under siege from more intense and frequent wildfires. This will certainly get worse, much worse, particularly if warming exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius. We are on a bad trajectory. Think of coastal cities flooded with water and southwest cities that can't get water. Think of a salt lake that is virtually gone and blowing dust over Salt Lake City. Deloitte, the management consulting firm, predicts that the differential between being responsible and reckless about climate could sum to more than $220 trillion globally between now and 2070. We use big numbers around here a lot. A $220 trillion swing in the global economy is massive, and Deloitte is not exactly a green outfit. There is some good news here. By acting now, we can minimize the damage and cost to households, businesses, and our economy. And there are huge economic opportunities from investing in climate action. The Inflation Reduction Act invested $370 billion to create good-paying jobs and new economic opportunities. It will lower energy costs for families and small businesses and accelerate the transition to clean energy. Looking ahead, a well-designed carbon border adjustment, an idea which has bipartisan support, would significantly curb greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. and overseas and boost American heavy industry against our Chinese competitors and reshore American manufacturing jobs lost in past decades. Let me close on tipping points. Tipping points are thresholds that change the trajectory of harm, potentially dramatically. One example is the tipping point where warming will cause the Greenland ice sheet to collapse and melt. We don't know exactly where that threshold lies. That is one of the dangers of our climate experiment. But science suggests it's between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of warming. Well, folks, we've already warmed 1.1 degrees, so the distance to 1.5 or 2 degrees is pretty short. If we lose the Greenland ice sheet, it's 22 feet of sea level rise. So we do well to avoid these tipping points, to avoid the systemic economic risks, to behave prudently and responsibly, and to take advantage of a stronger and more stable clean energy economy that beckons. It is long past, Mr. President, time to wake up. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Sen Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Is the uh, Senate presently in a quorum call? No, no, we are not. The senator is recognized. And I may proceed. Terrific. Thank you. I'm here for now the 21st in my series of speeches about the uh, scheme to capture and control our Supreme Court, a scheme to which right-wing special interests have devoted hundreds of millions of dark money dollars. The ingredients in this noxious cocktail are creepy right-wing billionaires, phony front groups, amenable justices, large sums of money, and secrecy. This month, we've gotten a whole new look 
at how these ingredients mix. According to extraordinary reporting by ProPublica, for more than 20 years, Justice Clarence Thomas has accepted luxury trips virtually every year from billionaire Harlan Crow without disclosing them. Here's how ProPublica described it. Thomas has vacationed on Crow's super yacht around the globe. He flies on Crow's Bombardier Global 5000 jet. He has gone with Crow to the Bohemian Grove, the exclusive California all-male retreat, and to Crow's sprawling ranch in East Texas, and Thomas typically spends about a week every summer at Crow's private resort in the Adirondacks. Close quote. One of those trips, Mr. President, has been valued at more than $500,000. We've heard from civil servants who have to report a gift of $5. This justice received a gift of a trip that they valued at $500,000. It was a trip to Indonesia on Crow's private jet, followed by, and I quote here, nine days of island hopping on a super yacht staffed by a coterie of attendants and a private chef. And that's just one excursion. No telling how many others there were. None of this was disclosed. The supposed rationale was that it was all personal hospitality. So let's set aside for one second the question whether this actually was personal hospitality. Let's presume that there was personal hospitality here somewhere. What that overlooks is the problem of the personal hospitality exemption, which covers exemption from disclosure of food, lodging, or entertainment received as personal hospitality of an individual food, lodging, or entertainment. Not transportation, not travel, not trips on Harlan Crow's private jet. ProPublica was able to identify multiple trips that Thomas took on Crow's jet, and each one of those trips seems to be a slam dunk violation of this provision. Not food, not lodging, not uh, entertainment, transportation. It does not stop there. Additional reporting by ProPublica revealed more of Crow's undisclosed generosity. In 2014, Crow purchased from Thomas and his relatives three properties in Georgia, including the home where Thomas's mother lives. There seem to be more collateral gifts in the form of renovations and an agreement that Thomas's mother would live there rent-free for the rest of her life. There's much more to learn about all of this transaction, but back to the disclosure. Here's what the law requires for property disclosures requires the disclosure of any purchase, sale, or exchange during the preceding calendar year which exceeds $1,000 in real property other than the property used solely as a personal residence of the reporting individual. If it's not your home, if it's any other real property, and if it's worth more than $1,000, the law requires that it be reported. Thomas disclosed none of this on the annual disclosure forms required by law. This law applies across the government. This isn't something special for the Supreme Court, but transparency is especially important for judges who must recuse themselves from cases if there's even an appearance of impropriety. Purchasing Thomas's property 
and offering him free international vacations weren't the only favors bestowed by the billionaire. In 2011, the New York Times reported on him having, quote, done many favors for the justice and his wife, including using his company to finance what the Times called the multi-million dollar purchase and restoration of a property where Justice Thomas's mother used to work, donating $175,000 to a Savannah library project dedicated to Justice Thomas, giving Justice Thomas a $19,000 Bible that belonged to Frederick Douglass, and providing $500,000 for Ginny Thomas, his spouse, to start a Tea Party-related group, end quote. Well, could any of that raise an appearance of impropriety? Or was it purely personal, nothing to do with the court? Well, let's have a look at a picture that shows us a little illumination of that. This is a painting that Harlan Crow commissioned during one of Thomas's visits to Crow's private lakeside Adirondack retreat. On the right here is Crow himself. Next to him is Justice Thomas. Crow sits on the board of two conservative organizations that file briefs before the Supreme Court. Crow is also a donor to the Federalist Society, from which Trump's infamous Supreme Court list emerged. And by the way, dark money surged into the Federalist Society during that period. Crow is also a political donor to Republican politicians. Investigation would show whether all this amounted to enough business before the court to create a conflict of interest. But the Supreme Court won't permit any investigation of its members. Here on the left is the infamous Leonard Leo the man behind that Trump Supreme Court list, whose three new justices created the far-right supermajority that Justice Thomas now enjoys. Leo's front group, the Judicial Crisis Network, bought the campaign ads for the three justices, paid for with dark money. Here's a graphic I've used before showing Leonard Leo's flotilla of front groups that he uses. He has more. This is just one assortment of his front groups. Here's the Judicial Crisis Network, which took checks as big as $17 million from anonymous donors and used that money to spend on ads for the confirmation of the three new justices. Leo is the one who helped the right-wing billionaires knock out Harriet Myers. Do you remember when she was a nominee for the Supreme Court by a Republican president? Knocked her out to make room for none other than Sam Alito to get onto the court. The campaign that Leo oversaw by the billionaires to capture the court has been tallied at more than $580 million. $580 million. Much of it dark money. And he recently received from another creepy right-wing billionaire a $1.6 billion slush fund into yet another 501c4 front group. So it is deeply misleading to claim that Justice Thomas 
never vacationed with people that had business before the court. Leonard Leo's business is the court. The creepy billionaire's campaign was to capture the court. Leo was the billionaire's contractor for construction of the court that dark money built. Personal hospitality. After Thomas gets on the court, a major Republican donor befriends him with half a million dollars for his spouse's activist group, a renovated home for his mother, and lavish undisclosed vac vacations, at which Thomas was sometimes accompanied by right-wing activists at the center of the scheme to capture the court. And we're supposed to believe this is all legit? I don't think so. And guess who else doesn't think so? Justice Thomas, who knew this smelled enough that he broke the disclosure law repeatedly to keep it secret. Guess who else doesn't think so? Ask other federal judges. They can't get away with this personal hospitality nonsense. They know this is wrong and that it's embarrassing to the judiciary. That's why the Judicial Conference just cracked down on the personal hospitality shenanigans of their Supreme Court colleagues. Thomas is feeling enough heat that he even released a public statement. Early in my tenure at the court, he said, I sought guidance from my colleagues and others in the judiciary and was advised that this sort of personal hospitality was not reportable and that he has always sought to comply with the disclosure guidelines. <laughs> wow, where to begin? First, who advised Thomas that this personal hospitality was not reportable? Whoever it was, they were wrong. I've spoken before about this personal hospitality issue. The reporting exemption for personal hospitality covers ordinary gifts of food, lodging, and entertainment from friends and family. There is not an exemption for transportation, for all that flying around the world in private jets. It just isn't there. We don't know who advised him, but I can pretty surely tell you who didn't advise him. That's the formal committees of the Judicial Conference that advise on ethics and financial disclosure issues. They have committees for this. That would be the obvious place to go for real advice, yet all indications are that he did not. I suspect that Thomas knew that they would not like the facts that he would have to disclose if he were to ask them in candor to offer an opinion on his situation. And he also, I suspect, knew that he would not like the answer that he would get. So he just didn't file. The recent definition of personal hospitality that the Judicial Conference announced in response to two years of urging from me, was intended to clarify what was already prohibited, a clarification that every other branch had already issued. And the reporting law never exempted private jet travel. Thomas actually knew this because he had reported flying on Crow's private jet before, back in 1997. What changed? Federal law is crystal clear on the need to report real estate transactions worth over $1,000. The law is so clear that CNN reported yesterday that Thomas will amend his disclosure report to include that sale. According to what CNN called a source close to Thomas, Thomas has always filled out his forms with the help of his aides, and he didn't think he needed to report the sale because he didn't make any money off it. Well. That excuse might be believable if the statutory language weren't so clear, crystal clear. And if Thomas weren't what one commentator has called a repeat offender at disclosure. In 2011, Thomas had to amend 13 years worth of financial disclosure reports to add his wife's income from the Heritage Foundation, a dark money, conservative, outfit which also files amicus briefs at the Supreme Court. He said it was a miss 
understanding. Here's what he misunderstood. Financial disclosure report form. B, spouse's non-investment income. If you were married during any portion of the reporting year, complete this section. Income, none, or date and source. That is not complicated. Those instructions are simple. And like his private jet travel, Justice Thomas had reported his wife's income before, back in 1996. What changed? Congressman Hank Johnson and I sent a bicameral letter to Chief Justice Roberts urging him to get his courthouse in order and set up a means to investigate these and other serious allegations of misconduct. We have also sent a letter to the Judicial Conference calling for the conference to refer Justice Thomas to the Attorney General for failure to report his real estate transaction with Crow. Here's how that works under the ethics law. The head of each agency or the judicial conference shall refer to the Attorney General the name of any individual which such official or committee has reasonable cause to believe has willfully failed to file a report or has willfully falsified or willfully failed to file information required to be reported. The Attorney General, in turn, may bring a civil action against any individual who knowingly and willfully fails to file or report any information that such individual is required to report. That is not complicated. And the Supreme Court is completely alone here in its peculiar approach to these issues. Wherever else you go in government, you will find an ethics code. And you will find a process for investigating and enforcing the ethics rules. Congress has ethics committees. The executive branch has an ethics office and inspectors general. Federal courts have their own ethics process. Only the Supreme Court has none of that. No designated place to submit complaints. No investigative mechanism to review complaints. No impartial panel to decide complaints. No transparency. All of that needs to change if we are to rebuild confidence in our highest court. Without investigation, it's impossible to determine if Justice Thomas violated still another federal law by participating in cases implicating his wife's political activities. We need investigation to find out whether he broke that law. Without investigation, there's no way to evaluate the ethics of the 20-year, $30 million private judicial lobbying campaign run by right-wing political activists who wined and dined Justices Thomas, Alito, and Scalia. The three justices who, as the New York Times described it, proved amenable. Amenable. Without any prospect of investigation, there's little reason for a justice to comply with the ethics standards. When there's no ref, there's ultimately no rules. The rule that clearly pertains is that it's not okay to judge one's own case. That rule is so obvious I hardly need to state it. And that rule is so old it's in Latin, nemo judex in sua causa. No one should be judge in their own case. We know that Justice Thomas is familiar with this rule because he cited it in an opinion he wrote just a few years ago when he noted that at common law, a fair tribunal meant that no man shall be a judge in his own case, end quote. This good old rule, grounded in history and tradition, the present Supreme Court constantly and flagrantly flouts. That must stop. The justices have lost 
the benefit of the doubt. 240 years the court went without needing this. But this Roberts Court has squandered the public's confidence with its behavior, and now there must be rules and process. The Senate Judiciary Committee, along with my subcommittee, will hold a hearing to consider these issues. I hope our colleagues will take it seriously. Congressman Hank Johnson and I have introduced the Supreme Court Ethics, Transparency, and Recusal Act, which would solve a lot of this mess, this big, tragic, unnecessary, self-inflicted mess. Let me conclude where I began, with that noxious cocktail of creepy right-wing billionaires, phony front groups, amenable justices, large sums of money, and secrecy. It's a toxic brew. The ethics failures at the court are just one part of that stinking cocktail. We have justices picked in some back room at the Federalist Society by creepy billionaires to put on a list for Donald Trump. We have justices who came through a confirmation process so tainted with influence that the FBI was breaking its own procedures in background investigations. And senators were pulling screeching 180s on confirming Supreme Court justices in an election year. Flotillas of front group amici, amici curiae, who won't tell who orchestrates and funds them, appear in court to tell those justices what to do. And the justices, with astonishing statistical reliability, do as they are told. To get the results they want, the justices smash through precedent, violate so-called conservative judicial principles, make up false facts, and change the applicable legal standards. All of this mess, all of it, is the product of that toxic brew of creepy right-wing billionaires, phony front groups, amenable justices, large sums of money, and secrecy. For now, let's at least fix the ethics mess and bring the Supreme Court into alignment with the rest of the federal courts. The highest court should not have the lowest standards. To be continued, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. May I ask that any pending quorum call be vitiated? We're not in a quorum call. Terrific. Uh, Mr. President, this is the 289th time that I have come to the Senate floor with my increasingly battered time to wake up chart to stir this chamber to act on climate change. Since 2016, I have been talking about the Zeta Joule. The Zeta Joule is the measure of how much fossil fuel emissions are heating up our oceans. In this season of extreme, record-smashing heat touching all 50 states, it is wild that elected representatives in Washington still choose to insulate themselves from reality, a reality measured in zettajoules. A zettajoule is a number almost beyond comprehension in its size. One joule, J-O-U-L-E, is our standard unit of energy, and it applies to heat energy. A zettajoule is one joule 
with 21 zeros behind it. It is a truly massive number. In a 2019 Time to Wake Up speech, I reported that more than nine zettajoules of heat energy was being added to the ocean annually. Since then, I've come to the floor with an updated number. Our oceans are absorbing around 14 zettajoules of excess heat every year. Let's put that in context. The total energy consumption of all humankind amounts to about one half of a zettajoule of energy per year. That means that for the fossil fuel component of that one half of a zettajoule of energy, we pay the price of 14 added zettajoules of heat into the ocean every year. Said another way, we load into our Earth's oceans every year nearly 30 times the entire energy use of the entire species on the entire planet. That is a big magnification. If this is the zettajoules of excess heat absorbed into the oceans every year, that dot is the average annual energy consumption of the human species on the planet. For the price of the fossil fuel component of that, mankind's entire energy consumption in zettajoules, we suffer that load of heat energy going into the oceans. That's a bit hard to comprehend, so consider one other unit of measure. The energy released by the detonation of the nuclear bomb America dropped on Hiroshima. In Hiroshima bomb terms, last year, the ocean absorbed the equivalent of seven Hiroshima bombs detonating every second in the ocean. Every second of every day for the entire year, seven nuclear detonations worth of heat into our oceans per second. This unfathomable amount of heat has been somewhat offset by La Nina, the cool phase of a recurring climate pattern called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. That's the acronym for the El Nino Southern Oscillation. The ENSO cycle consists of variations in sea surface temperature, rainfall, surface air pressure, and atmospheric circulation it's located over the Pacific Ocean near the equator. And in that oscillation, La Nina is the name for the cooling period. Well, in June, we left La Nina and moved into an El Nino period. El Nino is the warmer side of the ENSO cycle. We saw it raise temperatures in previous cycles in 1998 and 2016. All those zettajoules of excess heat being dumped into the Earth's oceans, and now we're headed into the warming part of the cycle. Watch for more heat records to fall. One major consequence for us of hotter oceans is stronger hurricane activity. Hurricanes are powered up more by hotter water as they move over the Atlantic. This June, sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic Ocean are the hottest in 170 years. The hottest in 170 years. Nine whole degrees Fahrenheit above normal. 
This is what is considered by science an extreme oceanic heat wave. And certain parts of the ocean are reaching the rare designation called beyond extreme. That's actually happening. On a scale from one to five, the North Atlantic's heat is either category four or category five, depending on where you are. Bring it home to Florida. Water temperatures in Florida have hit records reaching as high as 101 degrees. That's not the air temperature, that's the ocean temperature. That's actually the recommended temperature for a hot tub. Indeed, that's the midpoint of the jacuzzi company's recommended range for its hot tub temperatures for healthy adults. Now, doctors recommend that children under the age of five avoid hot tubs over 95 degrees, and pregnant women are advised to stay out of water once it gets much above 100 degrees. So the ocean off Florida is almost too hot for many humans. Almost too hot for humans means definitely too hot for many ocean creatures, particularly ocean corals. Coral reefs matter because they support a quarter of all known marine species. Florida has the largest coral reef ecosystem in the continental United States, the third largest living barrier coral reef in the world. If you don't care about creatures and only care about money, well, Florida's protected waters contribute billions of tourism dollars to the Florida economy. All of that is in jeopardy in this heat. According to NOAA, when temperatures reach one degree Celsius, or about two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal, corals cross what is called their bleaching threshold. That is where they turn white as they evulse the living creatures that keep them alive, and that is a step on the way to death. That is bad news, considering the temperatures around Florida have been running five degrees above normal. And the longer this goes on, the more trouble corals will have recovering. We hear sometimes about 100-year or even 500-year storms these are storms that are so extreme, they're expected to occur only once every 100 or 500 years. Well, scientists have put this Florida heat wave off the charts. Ben Kurtman is the director of the Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies at the University of Miami. He says, if you just wrote a statistical model and said, what are the chances of this level of warming it would be one in 250,000 years. Not one in 100 years, not one in 500 years, one in 250,000 years. If that's not a warning that it's time to wake up, I do not know what is. Ultra rare, Weather events are not so rare anymore in this climate-changed world. This is not just happening in the United States, it is worldwide. This summer, most of the oceans on planet Earth have at least a 70% chance of experiencing what are called marine heat wave conditions. The effects of marine heat waves read like biblical plagues, decreased oxygen, dead zones, fish die-offs, and then come the weather effects. Droughts in some places and increasingly deadly and dangerous storms in others because our oceans drive our weather on this planet. Over the course of a weekend last month, thousands of dead fish washed up along the Texas Gulf Coast. 
they died of lack of oxygen. Warm water holds much less oxygen than cold water. The ocean, through heat, becomes anoxic, and this slaughter results. Again, if you don't care about creatures and only care about money, in the United States, last year alone, there were 18 separate billion-dollar weather and climate disasters exceeding $175 billion in total cost, and by the way, costing nearly 500 Americans their lives. Aside from those sudden disasters comes the slow and insidious changes ocean warming brings, like the accelerating creep of sea level rise across your coast and mine, Mr. President. As ocean temperatures increase, two things happen. One, Ice in the Arctic and Antarctic melts, adding water to the ocean. And two, seawater expands. Remember those zettajoules. Combined, the effects of melting ice sheets and expanding seawater volume increases sea levels along our coasts. And that slow creep of sea level rise is not as slow as it used to be. The ocean rose more than twice as fast this decade as it did the previous decade, and last year set a new record high. The news gets worse. There is a centuries-long time lag in the natural systems causing sea level rise, meaning that we're only seeing the leading edge of what we have caused. Even if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, ocean levels would continue to rise for decades. NOAA has predicted that the acceleration will continue, that sea level rise along the U.S. coastline will rise 10 to 12 inches just over the next 30 years, as much as the entire rise measured over the last century. One way to help deal with this is through the National Coastal Resilience Fund, a grant program that restores, increases, and strengthens natural infrastructure to protect coastal communities and to protect habitats for fish and wildlife. The fund invests in conservation projects that restore or expand our natural protections, coastal marshes and wetlands, dunes and beach systems, oyster and coral reefs, coastal forests, rivers, and floodplains, and barrier islands that minimize the impacts of storms and sea level rise, as well as other dangerous events like lost fisheries from ocean warming. This program is so direly needed that it is vastly oversubscribed. In 2022, over $600 million of projects went unfunded because there simply wasn't enough money in the program. Nearly half a billion dollars in unfunded protections for vulnerable coastal communities. I'll give you one example of where this program is important. In 2019, the fund awarded a million dollars to the Alaska native village of Shaktulik to restore ocean coastal dune habitat and to construct a natural storm surge berm. Well, last year, along came Typhoon Murbach and devastated parts of the Alaskan coastline. Jacques Tulik was at the epicenter of the typhoon. The berm successfully protected the community from devastating coastal flooding. As one resident noted, the berm saved our lives. That's the value of resiliency planning and investment. But more than just brace ourselves for the baked-in effects of fossil fuel emissions poisoning our planet, we need to head off climate change at the oil spigot. That means taking on the fossil fuel industry's increasingly desperate lies and its well-funded political juggernaut that does such evil in this building. We know how to solve this problem. We just don't do it because fossil fuel fingers creep 
through so many corners of the Capitol. In the time it took me to deliver this speech, around 6,000 Hiroshima bombs of excess heat energy were put into our oceans. Every day, it's getting worse. We completely underestimate how bad things are going to get. Completely. Even people who care about climate change and believe that it's real and aren't in tow to the fossil fuel industry and its dark money, they still completely underestimate how bad this is going to get. And the tragedy is, it has always been preventable. Simply by moving to a productive, economically valuable, clean energy future and stopping our indulgence of fossil fuel pollution and obstruction. If what is going on with climate change heat going into our oceans is not enough to wake us up, I do not know what will. It is certainly, certainly time to wake up. I yield the floor. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, I am uh, back for now the 290th time to urge this chamber to act on climate change. I've got my trusty graphic here, which after nearly 300 of these is getting a little battered. Uh, this evening I'd like to talk about two things. First is the grim parade of climate-driven disasters the United States and the world has experienced over the last several months. Then our hearings in the Budget Committee on the enormous budgetary and economic dangers caused by fossil fuel emissions. Let's start with the unprecedented warming the world is experiencing. This June was the hottest June on record. Then July became the hottest month on record. Then August became the hottest August and the second hottest month on record. And September was just declared the hottest September on record and by the largest margin. Here's what that looks like when you compare it to previous years. We have popped out of the zone of previous experience. So 2023 will almost certainly become the hottest year on record, with the first significant chance that global average temperature will hit 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial average. Exceeding that 1.5 degree Celsius point will expose us to dangerous tipping points, things like ice sheet collapses that could cause dozens of feet of sea level rise. More than 6,500 daily heat records were broken in cities and towns across the U.S. this summer. Phoenix experienced a record 55 days this year with temperatures above 110 degrees with a 31-day streak. People who fell on Phoenix pavement required medical attention for burns. The Midwest experienced its worst drought in over a decade, with huge swaths of the Midwest, Southwest, and the South still under the most severe drought designation. Extreme drought in Hawaii set the conditions for its lethal wildfire. In Vermont, New York, and Pennsylvania, storms triggered deadly floods. Florida's Gulf Coast was hit by Hurricane Idalia, which intensified rapidly over warmed up waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Wind speeds increased almost 55 miles per hour in just a 24-hour window. Around the world, Europe baked, China hit record high temperatures, Italy suffered its worst flooding in a century, and more than 21,000 Libyans are dead or missing after massive flooding. 
Record-breaking fires ravaged Greece and Canada. Canada's fires burned an area roughly the size of Oklahoma. The smoke. Here's the annual acreage of Canadian wildfires, and here's this year. Top year before, down here. This is what we got last year. The smoke from these fires blanketed the eastern seaboard for weeks. Here in Washington, doctors said that breathing the smoke-choked air was worse than smoking a half-pack of cigarettes. New York, looked like this. The list of unprecedented, record-breaking, and worst-in-history climate events goes on and on. These disasters seen separately fail to capture the full scale of the problem. When you look at them together, you see that we are creating a climate for our own habitation unlike any in the history of humankind. We are increasingly testing the limits of human habitability on this planet. And it will worsen if we don't act. Which brings us to the Budget Committee. Set aside the destruction of lives and livelihoods, the 250,000 250, deaths around the world each year caused by fossil fuel emissions. Look just at the financial havoc. Last year, weather-related damage in the United States topped $165 billion, the third costliest year on record. This year, we've had 23 separate billion-dollar climate disasters already, and that's just counting direct physical damage. Just now, in the CR, we had to add $16 billion in disaster relief funds, and that's only a stopgap. Failing at our climate responsibilities is immoral, but it is also irresponsible, fiscally irresponsible. So the Budget Committee did a deep dive into the fiscal costs and risks of climate change. Across 10 Budget Committee hearings already this year, central bankers, financial experts, economists, insurance executives, political leaders, and other responsible experts described increased budget costs and systemic risks looming over the U.S. economy. What's systemic? Systemic means that the damage spreads beyond the immediately affected sector and cas cascades throughout the economy. Remember 2008, when a meltdown in the mortgage market cascaded through the economy and brought the Great Recession. Between October 2008 and April 2009, 700,000 Americans lost their jobs every month. American households lost $17 trillion in wealth. The federal government's debt grew by $5 trillion from lost revenues. Our economy still carries the scars. And in one of our budget hearings, a former chief economist from Freddie Mac said that climate change could cause a crash in coastal property values that would be just as bad. Just as bad. Sea level rise and worse coastal storms are on their way to making more than a trillion dollars in coastal real estate uninsurable and therefore unmortgageable. And that's when you get that crash. Not when the water pours in across your doorstep but when 30-year mortgages won't cover your property because that risk of the water coming over the doorstep is so foreseeable. And it's not just coastal property either, we heard. There's a whole separate risk from wildfires that a similar death spiral occurs for Western property values. And we had a hearing on that. The other systemic threat we had a hearing about is that the fossil fuel industry is artificially propped up, both by massive political subsidies and crooked international cartel pricing, and that as inevitably declining demand for its products occurs, 
that in turn will cause a dash for the exits when other countries that pump enormous amounts of oil and gas abandon the cartel pricing, sell it for what they can get, the dash for the exits. When that happens, it will strand hundreds of billions of dollars in fossil fuel assets in what is called a carbon bubble collapse. Each of these three systemic risks is well documented. Each could create a massive economic crash. And added to that is the steady, relentless cost increases, the climate inflation from insurance prices, from lost and damaged infrastructure, from increased health care needs, and from climbing food prices as increased temperatures, higher sea levels, and precipitation anomalies break up world food supply patterns. We've had hearings on those, too. At our very first hearing, a former governor of the banks of England and Canada and a former director of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office and Goldman Sachs's former head of risk management all underscored the economic urgency of solving climate change and the foreseeable hit of climate change on public budgets. They all suggested that a price on carbon so polluters pay for harms they cause would be fiscally and economically responsible. One Republican member of the committee embraced a domestic price on carbon and noted that a carbon border adjustment, a tariff on imports from carbon intensive economies such as China's, would use market forces to decarbonize the global economy. I couldn't agree more. I've had that bill in the Senate for years, a carbon price with a border tariff. A later hearing brought conservative support for that kind of climate action from former Australian conservative Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and former Republican Majority Leader Bill Frist. Up against our serious, nonpartisan, and knowledgeable witnesses, among them witnesses with real fiduciary obligations and real economic stakes, with every motive to get it right, the Republican witnesses often spouted fossil fuel disinformation, often funded by dark money industry front groups. We heard some beauties. One witness, a former mouthpiece of the tobacco industry, stated that secondhand smoke was not a public health issue because lung cancer and emphysema are not contagious, like that's the problem. One witness produced cherry-picked and misleading testimony so easily refuted that even the fossil fuel-friendly Montana Attorney General dropped her off his witness list in the youth climate case he was defending, a trial that the young plaintiffs won against the state of Montana, by the way. Another witness informed us that sea level rise was nothing to worry about because New York, Miami, and Boston will all just move. Republican witnesses spouted the usual debunked falsehoods, that renewable energy is expensive, that the fossil fuel industry isn't subsidized, that the science around climate change is uncertain, that transitioning to clean energy will be bad for the economy. It's all nonsense, and they say it anyway. One witness even tried to accuse the financial services sector of having a conflict of interest behind what she called its climate alarmism. But then she had to admit under examination that the fossil fuel industry was the one with the economic incentive to minimize climate dangers and shouldn't be trusted as a reliable source. Many of the Republican witnesses have made careers out of being industry shills, sheltered in a fossil fuel funded array of front groups like the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, and the Heritage Foundation, just to be trotted out for hearings like these. Well, our hearings began in February, and they got very often this response from the other side. But let's take a look at what we warned about and what happened since. Well, first of all, there's that accelerating cascade of climate disasters 
that I discussed at the beginning of the speech, so I won't relitigate that. Let's go on to insurance. Our hearings in February and March warned of turbulence ahead in the insurance industry. These predictions are already coming true. Hearings in February and March, by July, insurers were exiting or reducing exposure in California, Florida, Texas, and Louisiana markets. And reinsurers exited Iowa, all citing exposure to climate-related losses. In Florida, homeowners' premiums have spiked to nearly four times the national average, with a 40 percent increase this year predicted. There are already signs that insurance affordability and availability are beginning to disrupt Florida's real estate market, exactly as foretold in our hearings. And I doubt Florida's state insurance fund is solvent. And don't think it's just Florida. Here's where climate risks are hitting home insurance markets. A lot of it is along the coast here, where hurricanes and sea level rise and increased storm and tide damage is putting home ownership at risk. You'll notice that the entire state of Florida is covered. But then out here, you get into wildfire-adjacent areas, where the wildfire risk is already causing uh, problems in the home insurance markets. In the face of these risks, all across the country, up against truly distinguished witnesses, real grown-ups who know what they're talking about, whose warnings are already coming true, Republicans frequently put up fossil fuel front group mouthpieces, paid not to understand the facts. Sadly, it's a sign that fossil fuel mischief persists. So in our 11th hearing, we showed how the fossil fuel industry has known for almost seven decades about these dangers they deny. As early as the 1950s, industry scientists left records of their warnings about climate change. They were measuring and predicting it. Industry scientists were measuring and predicting it, and they knew their fossil fuel products were causing it. In 1977, Exxon senior scientist James Black told Exxon's management committee, and I'm quoting him here, there is general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. 1977, that's what Exxon's scientists told Exxon's management. Well, other scientists noticed it too, and Congress began pursuing legislation that would have addressed climate dangers. Big Oil responded with billions of dollars in fossil fuel-funded disinformation, lobbying, and dark money election spending. They're still at it, as the more preposterous witnesses attested by their presence it wasn't always so. During my first years here in the Senate, climate legislation was bipartisan. John McCain ran for president on a serious climate platform. But in January 2010, the Citizens United decision set loose a barrage of political spending by the fossil fuel industry. Worse, the court allowed that spending to be secret to hide the identity of the spender. The fossil fuel industry was ready with unlimited dark money and, and with the secret threats and promises that the ability to spend unlimited dark money allows you to make. And between the spending and the threats and the promises, the fossil fuel industry snuffed out bipartisanship on climate. And like that, from January of 2010, the date of Citizens United forward, no Republican has gotten on a serious climate bill in the Senate. Collectively, 
Fossil fuel interests, through trade organizations and through their dark money front groups, have spent billions of dollars that we know of so far on ads, on lobbying, on campaign contributions, and on super PACs. Super PACs, by the way, didn't exist before Citizens United. That monstrosity is a creation of Citizens United and dark money. The delay in climate action that those billions of dollars bought has directly caused the economic perils that our hearings have spotlighted. Organizations like the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, by 2021 had received over half a billion dollars from fossil fuel and other dark money interests. This is the web of various fossil fuel funded front groups with the bulk of the funding unidentified. That's the dark money blob in the middle of this web. And here are some of the key groups into which political money flowed to support climate denial and climate skepticism. Political money flowed through anonymizing intermediaries into Republican super PACs. Lobbyists from industries and trade associations crawled around this building. They spent a fortune. But for all the billions that they spent, this political and propaganda effort was a bargain, a corrupting bargain, but a bargain. The International Monetary Fund calculates using a peer-reviewed procedure that we subsidize fossil fuels by $760 billion, billion dollars annually in the United States alone, $760 billion is the subsidy the IMF points out that the fossil fuel industry floats on in this country. So let's say the fossil fuel industry spent $7.6 billion on political influence and secret corruption schemes every year they'd be pocketing a subsidy dollar for every political influence penny that they spent if they protected their $760 billion subsidy. It's the best money they could possibly spend. It's more rewarding than drilling for oil. But while corrupting Congress may have been a bargain for them, the price of a corrupted Congress was very high for everyone else. We lost an essential decade from the Citizens United decision in January of 2010 and our passage of the IRA, the first serious piece of climate legislation passed by Congress. More than $10 trillion of our national debt stems from the 2008 financial crisis, a warned of economic shock, and the COVID pandemic another warned of shock. Those trillions of shock debt amount to 40% of our total national debt. Climate disruption shocks are looming, predicted, clearly predicted. Just like climate change and its consequences were predicted clearly predicted. And now, as we've seen, the climate change consequences are here. The shocks are still looming. I'll close by saying that the threat from climate change to the federal budget is probably the least of our climate worries. As we think about the damage we're doing to the natural systems that have made Earth habitable for humankind, as we think about new diseases and dangers and destruction, as we think about wars and suffering as resources shift and global scarcity replaces global abundance, as we think about the lost species, 
the lost places of beauty, the lost natural harmonies, the lost human traditions, the trout stream you can't teach your granddaughter to fish at because the trout aren't there. By some measures, the money is the least of it. But here, in Mammon Hall, we seem to care most about the money. So our Budget Committee hearings have made clear that warnings abound of what droughts, floods, wildfires, and heated rising seas will do economically to American families and businesses and to our federal budget. The long predicted damage has already begun. It's gone beyond science predictions. It is now within the fiduciary horizons of businesses who are having to report to shareholders on climate risks because it has become so real and so immediate that their fiduciary obligations demand that reporting. That's why the fossil fuel industry cooked up this whole phony anti-ESG show that they've put on to try to push back against the fiduciary obligations that so many corporations are feeling obliged to meet. And these looming systemic economy-wide threats are real. And nothing says that it's going to be either the coastal crash or the wildfire crash or the carbon bubble crash. Nothing says that all three can't happen. If we are to be serious about debt and about deficits and about federal spending, we'd better damn well be serious about climate change. It is. As my trusty old graphic says, time to wake up. I yield the floor. So